Philip Pound Baker and welcome to COVID Cryptography Module 5 on Block Ciphers. So in the last module we looked at stream ciphers which are fast and can be secure but you have to be a bit careful about how you apply them or they can turn into a two time pad which is a very insecure form of cipher and you can lose all your security. And uh, this leads my friend John Callis to say, don't use a stream cipher to do the work of a block cipher. What is a block cipher? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at today. So um, a stream in a stream cipher, we, it works one character or byte at a time. And we use a very simple combination function to combine our cipher stream with our plain text. A block cipher works on a block of bits at a time, typically 64 bits at a time or 128 bits at a time. And what this allows is a much stronger mechanism. Um, it allows us to have a much more controlled approach to how we do the mixing and the enciphering. So, uh, so we're on, but we're only going to get 64, 128 bits of data encrypted at a time. So we're going to have to have some mechanism, what we call a mode, uh, involved that allow us to encrypt longer pay, longer plain texts. So. The basis of a block cipher, we have an input, we have an output, and we have a key. And those are the, and those give us our basic encryption function. The history of block ciphers is they were originally proposed uh, in the work of Claude Shannon, in that he called them iterated product ciphers. Well, people have been doing them before, but they hadn't really been thinking of them as a distinct something. And at this point in the course, we're going to be looking at the block itself as a black box. Uh, we may come back in a more advanced course and look at how that box is constructed. But you know, my general feeling on crypto is you need to see how all the parts go together before we can see what the importance of certain details are. Um, you know, it's like trying to understand a motor car by focusing on the details of the working of brakes until you got the idea, oh, there's an engine, there's a brakes, there's a carburetor and so on. So we want to look at the whole system before we go into the detail. Uh, the first widely used block cipher was a system called Digital Encryption Standard or DES. And uh, this is a 64-bit block cipher with a 56-bit key. And it's widely used in the banking industry even today. It is the technology that made automated teller machines possible. It was developed by IBM as a submission to a US government competition being run by the National Bureau of Standards, which was the forerunner of NIST. And IBM won the competition, obviously. Uh, uh, and afterwards, but the entry to the competition wasn't what actually became DES. Uh, there was uh, some modifications to that entry uh, due to some joint work with the National Security Agency. And so the details of that uh, work uh, were completely secret for you know, 20, 30 years. Um, but one thing that we did know was that the key size of DES was reduced from 64 bits to 56. And this was all taking place in the mid 1970s. And so, you know, this was the Vietnam War era, the Nixon era, Watergate. And so there was an enormous amount of suspicion and paranoia to do with anything involving the US government. And this is interesting actually in that it was that paranoia that really set off renewed interest in cryptography in academia, both in the United States and in other countries. 
the deaths uh, competition and the aftermath uh, had a direct bearing on the invention of public key cryptography, at least as far as the public invention goes. And so people started looking at the design of DES, and in particular, there was one little part of DES, the design of the S boxes that a lot of people worried about because they would look at these S boxes. Uh, and you know, basically, the basic uh, architecture of DES is it is 16 rounds of bit churning in which parts of the data are sent through these S boxes, and then some other transformations are. Uh, applied uh, in between. And so people said, well, how did you pick the constants in the S boxes? And the inventors, you know, we're not saying. And so, of course, that made people um, very suspicious. And the suspicion continued for another 20 years until Binham and Shamir uh, developed what was called, what they called differential, differential cryptanalysis. And their attack involved sending two related uh, messages, plain text, through the encryption cipher and seeing uh, how they were encrypted under the same key. Uh, this is what's called a chosen plain text attack. Um, it, it, it's, it's a bit more credible than you might uh, imagine, uh, a bit more plausible that these circumstances would arise. Uh, and they discovered that they could actually break the system uh, by using the pairs. Only they could break a general SBOX cipher, but when they tried differential cryptanalysis on DES, they found that the SBOXs that were being used were in fact surprisingly robust and that the security of the DES algorithm was in fact 55.6 bits according to their differential analysis attack and at that point the hypothesis changed from the NSA tried to destroy uh, the security of DES to the NSA actually made it better made it stronger and uh, Bruce Schneier said, you know, it took the field 20 years to work out that the NSA had improved the security of DES. And this actually comes back to um, an NSA uh, maxim, which is nobody but us. The NSA is very happy to give people faulty crypto. They, 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 they just love it and they've, we've caught them doing it. Uh, at some times in the past, and we'll get to that with uh, dual ECRNG at some point. But what they don't do, or what they claim not to do, is to break a system in such a way that somebody else could break it. And that was particularly important with DES because when DES was being designed, it was always intended for use in the US financial system. It was designed for use by US banks. And so if it had been less secure than intended, that would have been a very serious problem. So DES is insecure for m multiple reasons. Uh, one of them is that the key size is just too small to be secure. It was, sec it was too small at the time it was proposed to be really credible. And it became possible to break it by brute force by the mid 1980s and this was starting to be done uh, for real with by uh, private groups uh, by the 1990s there's a machine deep crack that was built for the sole purpose of uh, breaking deaths by John Gilmore on the EFF and Paul Kosher and some other folk worked on that and it was a purpose designed brute force cracker for deaths and the reason that it could break DES in, um, I think it was uh, a few hours uh, it broke DES, uh, was because the key size was just too small. But, you know, hey, it's 1970s technology here. You know, wake up, you know, don't expect to use 1970s crypto in 2020 and have good results. So having said that, people still use DES today. Uh, and that's because it's deeply embedded in the infrastructure 
and there are still some remaining regulations that say take this data and encrypt it using DES. And so what people started to do to improve the security was say, okay, I'll, I'm required to use DES, but I won't just do it once, I'll do it twice. And so instead of having a 56-bit key, I'll have two of them, so it'll be 112. Which sounds like a really good idea. You know, 112-bit key, you know, it's getting to the acceptable level. It's not 128, but it's close enough. But it turns out that the key size is 112, but the work factor is only 2 to the power 57. Oh, why, why is this? Well, that's because of what's called a meet-in-the-middle attack. To get a work factor of 112, you actually have to do the encryption three times. And the way this is done is that you encrypt, you decrypt, and then you encrypt again. What, why do you do it that way? Well, if you have this implemented in a hardware device, you can set all the three keys to be the same thing, and then the result of putting it through this piece of hardware will be sim the same as doing single deaths. If you make the keys different, well, then you get triple deaths. It's just one of those optimizations. So three deaths, it's a real thing. It is still used. Uh, again, I'll come back for reasons why you shouldn't use it. But it's still only giving you 112 bits of data. Well, why is that? Well, let's go back to the two key version. Uh, and we're looking at a particular t attack called a known plaintext attack. And what I'm doing at this point in the course is I'm introducing you to each of the types of attack individually. And then at some point we'll go back and we'll summarize everything and uh, you know, systematize it. So a known plaintext attack, the attacker knows the input and the output uh, for at least one or two blocks. And what they want to do is to find the key. And this actually is a quite a common occurrence when you're trying to do cryptanalysis, because when you're encrypting uh, chunks of data, very often there's chunks of that data which, which are known to the attacker. So when it came to an Enigma decrypts, the uh, allies knew that every day there was a weather report that would go through and this would start off with weather report in German, of course. And so they had a chosen, they had a known plain text attack. And so, so we'll, we'll assume that we know two of the blocks, but not the rest. Okay, so how do we go about breaking it? Well, first of all, what I'm going to do is that we've got two separate uh, systems here. We've got an, the first encryption, and we've got the second encryption, and they're using different keys. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, I know the input, but I don't know this midpoint. So the first thing I'm going to do is to go through every possible combination of key on that first module and I'm going to store all the results in an enormous table and you know at the point when uh, these uh, systems were first being proposed um, this was you know unthinkable you know because you're going to have terabytes worth of data well I'm recording this on a one terabyte uh, solid state drive you know one terabyte isn't a lot of data these days and so we can certainly exhaust the desk key space and save that result out to, um, to a disk or whatever. So we start off with the input. Uh, we go through same input each time, trying every permutation of key. And we've stored that in memory. And now we're going to do the same effectively on the output, only this time, we know what the output is, and we know that the uh, midpoint must be the same. So the output of the first module must be the same as the input to the second. And so what that means is that for each of the first keys, there is one unique second key that can produce the correct output value. 
And so what we go, do is we go through each one of these, um, these in turn, and we see, okay, what would be the output? For, you know, what, what key do we need to get that particular output value? And, you know, again, we can uh, we, we can go through that. You know, we, we simply set it up for decryption mode. OK, and so we can work out which of the which pairs of keys are possible. So for each second key, there is a unique first key that allows the combination to produce the right output. And so what we do is we decrypt the second use our decryption to find the midpoint for that second block and then look up the corresponding first key uh first part of the key then we take those two pieces and we try and decrypt our second try piece of known pl plain text and if that combination is correct then we found the correct key combination otherwise we go on to the next one and so what this does is, in effect, it reduces the key space from 112 to two key spaces of 2 to the power 56 that we can search in parallel. So we've got a trivial decomposition of the problem into from 112 bit, 2 to the power 112, to 2 times 2 to the power 56. And so... The meet in the middle attack is a very serious problem f that uh, means that you don't want to use simply double desk. You want to use triple to get up to your 112 bits. And you know, it's the same in cryptography in general. You know, if you've got a system that's easily decomposed into two separate modules and the attacker can take each of those modules independently, then instead of multiplying the uh, possible number of keys, you're only adding the number of possible keys. And that makes a big difference to your work factor. So the meet in the mi middle attack uh, is interesting. And the same principle is used within the design of block ciphers like DES and AES to make sure that we're proof against that type of trivial decomposition and that is the reason why most block ciphers are designed with multiple rounds which involve a combination of two distinct types of mathematics so in DES you do your s boxes and then you do some bit shuffling operations then you do another s box and bit shuffling and in aes you do likewise, only we're using operations now that are optimized to the capabilities of model, modern uh, CPUs. So what I've shown you up to now is I've shown you a way that we can en encipher one block of text. But, you know, it's not very useful, particularly for desks. I mean, like you're only encrypting uh, eight bytes. Uh, what good's that going to be? We need to have some way of encrypting a longer message if we're going to have anything useful and so to do that we need to have a block cipher mode and there are various ways of doing that and when what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of them and then we're going to go back and evaluate them according to three criteria which is do they allow us to encrypt and decrypt uh, random blocks within the cipher text uh, do they support parallel, encry parallel encryption? Do they support parallel decryption? That is, uh, if you're doing those operations, do you have to start at the beginning and work through in sequence? Or can you have two different cores encrypting or decrypting different parts of the ciphertext at the same time? If you've got a 16-core machine, can you keep all of your 16 cores busy on that single cipher text and again that's a very important consideration when we get down to um, implementation <coughs> so the simplest mode is the electronic codebook mode and what we do here is we divide the plain text up into blocks um, 
we'll come back to what you do if you don't have a complete number of blocks uh, that's called padding and we'll come back to that a bit later but for now assume that we have um, a nice round multiple of 8 bytes or 16 bytes or whatever uh, in our plain text and that is actually what happens on disk drives which is the main application in which uh, uh, ECB mode is used so what we're going to do is we're going to take each, uh, take that plain text eight bytes at a time and we're going to encrypt each of those chunks, those blocks, under the same key and the output will be the ciphertext. And so the data is encrypted, right? Okay, well, let's look at an image that I have encrypted using DES in... ECB mode. It's encrypted. Can you guess what it says? Uh, it's encrypted, right? Well, actually, it is encrypted, but it doesn't give us any real security. It's not obscuring the, um, the image. And the reason for that, again, it comes down to patterns in that all that ECB mode is doing is uh, obscuring the fine grain pattern on the disk, uh, in the plain text, it's not hiding the larger scale pattern. And so what I've done there is that each pixel is represented by a 16-bit code. Uh, pixel is a uh, one unit of the image. And so what I did was I took uh, the image, I converted it to pixels, I encrypted each pixel uh, each blocks of four pixels using DES and then rendered the output uh, using my uh, output function. And so the effect is that the only time in which the DES function makes any difference is when it comes to the boundary between one block of color and the next. The blocks of color, uh, you know, most of the image is made up of four bytes that are either white or black and so that means that uh, it isn't a very good uh, encryption mode at all and so you know, my advice is just never use ECB mode uh, as I'm going to show you there are much much better uh, choices. One of those choices and a very commonly used one is cipher block chaining mode CBC and the idea of CBC is that we're going to combine each plain text input block with the last ciphertext output. So instead of just putting the plain text into the block as it was, we take the last output, take the next input, XOR the two together, and that is the input into our ciphertext. And it's um, a very um, you know, it's a very solid mode of uh, encryption. Um, it does have a few uh, problems when you try to get non-confidentiality properties from it, which we'll come to at some point when we look at Kerberos. But it's a, it's a, a, a very solid uh, cipher mode. Uh, now, you might ask, oh, what do we do with the first block? You know, do, do we just uh, use all zeros? Well, no, what we actually do instead is we have an initialization vector to start the whole thing running, and that's just a block of uh, all zeros. So, sorry, so instead of using all zeros, we use a, an initialization vector, and that is specified with all the other uh, encryption parameters. Okay, so it's... Um, it's a strong uh, means of uh, encrypting data. The only problem is that because you've got this sequential uh, link, um, you can decrypt blocks of um, blocks in parallel because your uh, your linkage is from ciphertext to plain text, uh, ciphertext to the input. Uh, when you're trying to decrypt, well you can look up the ciphertext values for the previous block. Uh, but so you can, so when you're encrypting, you cannot encrypt 
in parallel. You can decrypt in parallel. Uh, you get random access read, but not random access write. And so um, it's not really something that you would want to use for a database application. And it's not something that you would want to use for whole disk encryption. And so, uh, and the other problem with it is a thing called the birthday attack. And this is a particular problem with DES. Um, okay, so uh, we, because of the birthday attack problem I mentioned when I was talking about message digest, there's a rule that says that if you are encrypting uh, chunks of uh, plain text in, in blocks, you only want, and you've got a block size of uh, 64, you only want to encrypt at most 2 to the power 32 blocks before uh, you change your key. And the reason for that is it's the same reason as the birthday attack. Because if you go beyond that point, you're going to have a point where you're encrypting the same block twice. And at that point, an attacker can start to guess parts of your plain text output, which is clearly undesirable. And so if you're encrypting a large amount of information, uh, you want to either change the key or have a larger bits uh, block size. And actually, the, um, the square root uh, criteria is actually the, you know, the limit case. You absolutely should not do that, go beyond that. Uh, the cautious value is uh, the, the quartic root. So um, if you've got a block size of 64 like you have with deaths, you're only limited to 2 to the 16 blocks, which is, that's only half a megabyte. You know, that's not even uh, one JPEG these days. So, you know, DES is it's not just limited because of the size of the key, uh, which you can fix with three DES. It's also limited because of the size of the block. And three DES doesn't fix the block size. To fix the block size, you need to switch to a different cipher. And the cipher of choice this uh, uh, at this point is the Advanced Encryption Standard, AES. So uh, this was another output of a NIST uh, crypto competition. So the competition ran from 97 to 2000 and the winner was a cipher called Rindel, uh, which was announced in 2000 and published as a standard as 2001. The advantages of AES are that it has a much larger block size, uh, 128 bits, and you have a choice of three key sizes. You can use 128 bit, 192 bits, and 256 bits. And so 20 years later, after the results of the competition were announced, uh, the work factors for AES, according to the very best known attack, are still very close to 2 to 128, 2 to the 192, and so on. Uh, there are attacks that slightly w limit, that weaken those uh, bounds, but if you look at the complexity of the operations and compare those, I mean, it's really doubtful that you're getting any cryptographic purchase by using any of the uh, attacks that is more significant than brute force. And the other thing is that even the smallest key size, 128 bits, is still way larger than is practical to break using any imaginable computer system. You know, reducing the work factor to, from 128 to 120 doesn't invalidate AES as a secure cipher. It would have done at the time we were picking it, but now that we've got it embedded, you know, 120. Uh, work to the power 120 work factor is something that I'm still uh, quite uh, comfortable with. If it was reduced to 110 or 100, then I would start to have real uh, issues. So AES 128 is the current workhorse for the industry. That is the go-to cipher and the go-to strength. But that is starting to change at this point. And in my work in the mathematical mesh, 
Uh, I only actually support the 256-bit uh, variant of DES. And the reason for that is in part because quantum computing, you know, quantum cryptanalysis, there is an attack that if somebody ever could build a big enough quantum computer, they could, in theory, be able to attack uh, the 128-bit AES with a complex time complexity of 2 to the power 64, which makes it breakable. But um, in practice, uh, they'd need a really, really big quantum machine to do that. So it's still probably within. But Prudence says go for 2 to, two to the 256-bit work factor, which the crypt quantum cryptanalysis would reduce to 2 to the 128. And we're still well within our safety bounds. So uh, AES-256 is secure even against quantum cryptanalysis. The other reason that I like AES uh, at the longer bit length is there are more rounds. Uh, AES-128 has 10 rounds, uh, 192 is 12, and 256 gives you 14. And going from 10 rounds to 14 rounds actually increases the cryptographic strength by a lot more. Um, the work factor really does uh, improve significantly. Um, just after the AES uh, competition was announced, result was announced, uh, Sh Adi Shamir at the uh, RSA conference uh, said, you know, he'd like to see NIST bump up the number of rounds a bit because, you know, as he was saying, seeing it, well, the criteria for winning the competition was how fast can you make your block cipher? Your performance was the key consideration. And he's saying, well, you know, now that we've we've got an output, you know, let's uh, make it, uh, let, let's bias it more towards robustness. And, you know, Shamir has done more uh, more work on uh, block cipher security than you know, the most. Um, so, yeah, I think he has a good argument. But, you know, if you want those extra rounds, you can get them just by going to the 256-bit key. And so... You know, if you're designing anything new, just go to AES-256. That's the, the new workhorse for the, in the um, industry. So I mentioned uh, electronic codebook, ECB mode, earlier. And so you're probably thinking, well, why would anybody want to use that? Well, the problem is that CBC is limited to that sequential encryption. It doesn't allow you to parallelize your... Uh, uh, encryption or ra do random r r writes but so people often use ECB because it does do those two trivially but there is a much much better choice and that is called counter mode so the idea of counter mode is that we start with a counter at a particular value and that's going to be you know, our de facto initialization vector and each time we encrypt a block, we're going to increase the value of the counter by one. And what we do is we simply take that, the output of the counter, and that is the input to our block cipher. The key is the same each time. And the output is going to be used as cipher stream in a stream cipher. So what we do is we generate blocks of cipher stream, one block at a time, and then we combine the plain text with the cipher stream block by block by block. And this has uh, a really nice feature in that it is parallel. You know, you, you can do all the operations in parallel. You can encrypt. You can even encrypt before you've got the message. You can decrypt before you've got the message. You can do randomized, um, you can do random access for read and write. And so this is a very good choice for disk encryption uh, or for database encryption. And the other thing is that because it's a stream cipher uh, mode of operation, that means that we don't need to worry about padding and our cipher text is not going to be uh, any longer than the plain text. We still got that initialization vector to worry about, but Later on, I'll come to some techniques that we can use that uh, avoid that as well. So counter mode is really powerful, 
and it is almost never used. Well, actually, it is used, but there's another variant of it called Gawa uh, mode, uh, Gawa counter mode, and that's used instead of pure counter mode because what that does is it adds an authenticated encryption mode. And so that's what we're going to be looking at in the next module. So counter mode is powerful, but if you're looking for an implementation of it, it won't be called CTR. Most cases, it will be called GCM. Okay, so there's a little bit that I've got to go back and talk about, which is padding, which is how to deal with the fact that our input is not necessarily the same length as the number of blocks. Well, one very simple way that we can go about padding uh, is called pen padding. Now, we've got two problems with padding. One is we want to be able to tell the person decoding it, decoding the message, how long the plain text is. You know, because you know, if they ha if they decrypt and there were three bytes over and they think there were four, well, that'd be bad. So what pen padding does is it Basically, if we've got one byte left over, then we set the extra byte to what zero one. If we've got two bytes left over, we'll set both of the leftover bytes to zero two, and so on, all the way up to seven leftover bytes. Well, what if there are no leftover bytes? Well, what we do then is we add a whole extra block and set all the bytes to eight. And you can do, and, and there are other types of padding that can be done, you know, because, I mean, at the end of the day, you're only actually ever going to need to read the very last byte to see how many uh, bits to chop off your uh, plain text uh, when you recover it. And so, you know, really, uh, it's only that last byte that matters and the rest can just be randomized if you like. But uh, this comes... But we're still making the length of our ciphertext longer. And this is a problem if you're trying to do database encryption. So say you have a, a client that says, OK, I've got this database. I've already bought it. And I want to be able to encrypt the individual fields in the database. But I don't want to change any of the column sizes or whatever. Now, I don't want the data to increase because that'll change our program elsewhere. Now, one solution to that is ju just use counter mode and get rid of the padding altogether. Another way you can do it is what's called ciphertext stealing. And so what this does is it allows us to avoid the increase in the size of our ciphertext, provided that the, mess that the uh, plain text is at least one block long yeah you know, we can't reduce you know, can't you have a block cipher that is secure with an output that's less than a block sorry so what we do is if there are no bytes left over when we uh, did our encryption well that's done you know forget it otherwise we're going to have some number of bytes left over that is less than a full block so what we do is we're going to call the bytes that are left over the head and the remainder, you know, the padding bytes that we would add, we'll call that the tail. So let's say we've got nine bytes of head and that means that we'll have seven bytes of tail. So when we get to the last but one full block, so we want, once we get to the last full block, what we do is we encrypt as usual, but we divide the output into the head and a tail. So when we get to our ciphertext output, we're going to have a, you know, there's going to be head bytes open in our ciphertext. So what we do is we take that num our nine bytes from the encryption output and those become our final um, ciphertext bytes. And this means that we have seven bytes that we've got to communicate to the decryptor somehow and we've got one full block uh, of uh, ciphertext left to uh, encrypt it and then we've also got the final nine bytes of the plain text and so what we do is we take the 
final nine bits of the uh but sorry nine bytes of the plain text we append the tail from the previous encryption output and then we put that through the encryption system and that becomes the penultimate block and so you have this kind of like this shuffle going on and that tail of bytes that actually gets encrypted twice over um but you know it doesn't really matter that uh, we're doing that because it's you know just random data uh, the plain text the ciphertext is just random anyway so what this allows us to do is to encode um all our uh, data without expanding the uh size of the output which is you know useful and convenient now you can define a ciphertext stealing mode for ecb or for cbc but in practice there's no reason to do it for ecb because there's really no good reason to be using ecb and counter mode doesn't have doesn't need padding anyway so if you see uh ciphertext stealing cts mode specified it almost always means cbc cts uh, and so it's a it's a useful uh, tweak so so where are we now so uh we've got four we've looked at four block modes in this particular presentation there are more there are many 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 more but the thing is that most of the time uh the reason i've not exhaustedly gone through the uh alternatives is that i don't see much point in going through bad crypto unless it teaches you something about crypto you know so uh there are other block modes but most of them stay away except for gcm and uh some others that we'll come to when we talk about authenticated so ecb mode uh, allows us for random access allows us for parallel encryption parallel decryption uh doesn't need an, an initialization vector does need padding but is you know pretty rubbish you know isn't secure so forget it cbc mode uh does allow us random reads but not random writes does allow us doesn't allow us to encrypt in parallel but we can decrypt in parallel um requires an initialization vector and requires us to pad out the the uh result and is a strong uh cipher mode cts mode or rather cbc cts uh doesn't same problems with uh, cbc still got the random access and the parallel you know those are still the same um but it still requires an initialization vector but it doesn't increase the uh, size of the cipher text uh provided that it's more than one the plain text is at least one block long and counter mode uh, allows for random access allows for parallel encryption decryption initialization vector doesn't require any sorry doesn't require it does require initialization vector but doesn't require us to think about padding and is also secure provided that as with any other stream cipher you implement it right so that's block ciphers and if we were following the pattern of what we do with message digest at this point this would be the point at which we'd start to look at some applications but actually i'm not going to do that and and here's the reason why there aren't really any applications of encryption all on its own that are compelling at least as far as i'm concerned message digest integrity all on its own that's really interesting but confidentiality without integrity to me is not interesting and to exp and it's not interesting to most protocol designers so before we can go ahead and start looking at some applications of encryption we really need to have one more piece of apparatus in our toolbox and that is called uh message authentication codes so we're going to be looking at uh authentication the other thing that we've not looked at yet is where does the key come from 
you know, I'm talking about encrypting with a key. You know, where did that come from? And that's what we're going to be looking at after we've done message authentication codes. And in particular, we're going to be looking at a system called Kerberos, which was one of the um, first real um, successful attempts at uh, a ubiquitous security infrastructure. And that's still used today. It's the basis for much of the security in Windows NT and many other operating systems. So that's what we've got to look forward to. And again, please, please like, please subscribe, and please spread the word. I mean, like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when we come out of uh, lockdown, you know, do you, do you want all your friends to be showing you uh, all the jigsaws they did? Or maybe maybe they'll tell you about the new skills that they've learned. You know, maybe if they tell you, you tell them about uh, this crypto course, maybe they'll be thanking you for showing them a new skill. So please like, please subscribe, and please come back for that next module on message authentication codes. Thank you.